I'm going to show you a, a collection of few works we have done at IFPRI um, in the recent years uh, regarding this uh, Doha round and um, the last developments. Uh, maybe just why we should care about this. Uh, obviously, we have to keep in mind that a global food security agenda and a healthy global trading system are going and in hand. If you want long-term sustainable growth, you need both. And in particular, in a context where people are worried about food security and some people associate it with self-sufficiency, it's very important to remind that trade has already been part of any food security agenda. And you will not see a uh, closed economy that has grown on the long run, improving food security and at the same time respecting environmental uh, constraints in its own country. So we should not forget it. And it is why, basically, the, the door around um, is about. So we know it's a long and painful pro uh, process. And earlier research, um, even if we have published uh, with, with Antoine Boué this paper about why the, the Doha development agenda was failing and what can be done, and that was not done on a, I would say, from a political science point of view, but just using quantitative uh, assessment and game theory. And this work was part of my PhD dissertation in 2004, so 10 years ago, we were already saying there is a problem here. And the problem is simple, because if you want to have a, a deal that will please 160 countries, you need to have a big cake. You know that everyone has something to eat. But the bigger the cake, the most painful will be the political reform associated to it. So, and policymakers have political constraints, and we should acknowledge it also. It's not just maximizing uh, global welfare or having an efficient system. You have an efficient system, but you want to sell it at home. And this narrow the scope for, for negotiation. So then you can start to do some fine tuning, adding more and more complexity in the negotiation. But doing this, you also weaken the whole negotiation process, because a very complex agreement is an agreement with a lot of asymmetry of information. And some countries will not understand what they will sign and will say no. So here you have a triangle, basically. You want ambition in order to have, basically, meat on the table, or right, depending on what you want. But that is something that will attract people. You want also to respect, so having kind of flexibilities to allow policymakers to sell the deal at home, and at the same time, to not have an agreement that is too complex, because otherwise people in some countries, and in particular weak countries, will not agree with it, because they will be afraid of what they will sign if it is very complex. And we are entering, in some cases, in a black box agreement. And we are navigating around these three things, and we have done. And especially if we were looking on, on, on the long run and when, in 2009, we were already looking at these eight years that we were uh, worrying that it would become infinite, what we have seen is that even if around the um, several years of negotiation, different proposals have been on the table, what we were in 2008 in terms of potential growth in terms of agricultural trade was very similar to the first proposal of 2003. Meaning that, of course, we can dream of more ambition, but what policymakers are overall ready to accept, we already know what is it. So praising for more ambition is still interesting, but we should not neglect the real capacity of the system to absorb policy reform at a point in time. Now, of course, in Bali, we get a new agreement, and I will discuss um, uh, soon what is inside. But it's still more a kind of general framework that really what is the core of a WTO uh, negotiation round, that's the first WTO, but at the GATT, at least, we have some experience, is in particular in agriculture, by how much we are going to address key issues, market access, by how much you cut your tariffs, what you do in domestic support about your subsidies, and what you do about export uh, subsidies. And we get, by 2008, a very rich framework with a lot of details about what can be acceptable. Of course, in 2008, we have not reached a, an agreement, but I will focus on this, because in terms of technical description, it's the last piece we have about really detailed contents. In Bali, we have general description and on a few topics more precision, more on the legal aspect than on the quantification, but the last a document we have in 2008, 
And you have a, a, a book that has been published by the World Bank that summarizes this, but in which IFPRI has been uh, actively collaborating, because I think that nearly half of the chapter are authored or co-authored by IFPRI people. So it's kind of the angle on the topic. Um, now, just to give you uh, a quick summary. Um, right now, in the Dora round, we have kind of ambitious formula, meaning that if you look uh, at this table with a lot of figures, you will see that we are ready to cut by more than uh, one third applied tariff in agriculture. So of course, bound tariff that is negotiated at WTO will be cut more, but concretely in terms of delivered liberalization, you can go up to one third. But the negotiators, both from developed and developing countries, have had flexibilities. You have special products, you have sensitive products that will have a different treatment. And this can water down significantly the deal. Also introduce asymmetry of information because initially you don't know what will be the sensitive product of your partners. And when you start to negotiate with 150 countries, that starts to become difficult to monitor who is doing what. But it may be the price to pay to have a, a, a political deal. And even with this flexibility, basically what we see is that we will still cut applied tariffs by 20%. So it may not be a revolution, but it's still a significant thing for global markets. Yeah. And it has consequences in terms of welfare uh, and, and GDP and trade. And agricultural trade can grow by here, if you will see it here for uh, trade in agriculture by more than 5%. When you combine the different parts of the deal, and in order to open this black box, when we do in this type of assessment, we try to identify the different parts of the negotiation, you know, the different pillars, and even among the agricultural negotiation, what matters. So it's not negligible, because it's something that's really important on, on the long run. Of course, this will depend by sectors, and I will not enter into this, but just to say that depending on which product you, you are uh, dealing with, there is a different story. And once again, it's important because different products may interest different countries, but also have implication in terms of uh, food security. Here, I just want to illustrate uh, a, a point, because this is about the development agenda. You can wonder why WTO has to focus on development, but still, it has been clearly an objective. And in this, we have to worry also about the least developed countries. That here, I'm going to look here about the agricultural value added in least developed countries and the effect of the different part of the negotiation. And I hope it will illustrate why we have this complexity in the negotiation and why we try to do some fine tuning sometimes. So basically, the fact that other developing countries are cutting their tariffs is going to increase the value added in LDC. Why? Because some country like Bangladesh can export more to India and so on. But overall, the concession done in applied protection by developing countries is still weak. So even if there are big economies like China, India and so on, the tariff reduction asked is limited. Now, also rich countries are going to open their markets. But for LDCs, they are already very open. You have everything but harms in uh, Europe. You have other programs like the DSP and so on all around the world. And basically, we are going to have a negative effect on LDC due to what we call preference erosion. Because you have these poor countries that already have a good access to developed markets. And if developed markets open on a multilateral basis, they will face more competition by emerging countries or by even other developed economies. So it will be more difficult for Benin to export some mango in Europe. Then you have effort on export subsidies. And here you have a neutral effect. Why? Because some countries today, including LDCs, import food that are subsidized. And because they don't produce it, it's a gift. Basically, it's a transfer from taxpayer in the US to some poor consumers in Angola. But some others are also exporting products like cotton that suffer on the world market from the competition by developed economies. And so here you have the effect that can cancel out. And then here you have the restriction on domestic subsidies by developed economies, and that will benefit, basically, the poor farmers, less unfair competition. So you see these different effects, and this is why we try also to have modeling to understand them, to disintegrate them, because initially it's not easy to know what it will be. Now, just to, to conclude, 
We have to think also that if you don't have an agreement, the world will continue to change. You can have, as I've said, a raise, a raise in protection because people may say, OK, the way to go is to be more protectionist, more self-sufficient. Also, you will have large scale agreements, but between big blocks, the US and Europe, the US and the ASEAN economies. And some countries may be left out of this. Who is going to spend a lot of time negotiation with Africa, for instance, if there is no market really there? And this will basically have consequence. And what we see in this type of research is that signing the door around is a kind of safety net for the global trading system. So even if the gains look small compared to today, the question is not compared to today, is what will be the situation in 10 years without a global agreement? Now, just to, to, to conclude, so that was basically the situation before Bali. In Bali, we have touched a, a few topics um, with um, about trade facilitation, a kind of ambitious agenda, but we still need to see how it will be put in practice. And for some agricultural products, in particular vegetables and fresh products and high value products, the time you spend and the time you lose when you want to cross a border is a loss of value. So it can have very specific interest for uh, some agricultural uh, producers. Now, on the other topic of interest uh, for agriculture, Honestly, the agreement is more weak. So we are not seeing even a moratorium in terms of export subsidies. People may have said, we are not going to use. Now they say, people should restrain the use of. So we have a kind of commitment but with a weak language. On the specific food security and food stock, Arrhenio, that will follow, we will talk about it, so I will let. And in a document that we will have online soon, we will have a more systematic review of this. Um, and we have a, a DOA web page on the free website where all these materials is available. Thank you.